local airliners, disrupted air transport, and broke windows on the ground as they shattered every safety regulation. The Reds lost. Parliament stayed in session until its scheduled recess. Up next on American History TV, co-authors William Leo Grand and Peter Kornblum discuss their book, Back Channel to Cuba, tracing the history of U.S.-Cuba relations from the time of the Cuban Revolution to today. On October 19, 1960, following Fidel Castro's rise to power, the United States imposed a trade embargo banning all exports from the U.S. to Cuba. More than 50 years later, this past December, the Obama administration announced a move to re-establish diplomatic relations. The co-authors chronicle these years of back-channel negotiations. This event from the Wilson Center is about an hour and a half. Thank you. I'm going to go first, and uh, it's just a great honor uh, to, to be here with you. The Woodrow Wilson Center has always been uh, one of the most wonderful centers to, to learn in, to listen in, uh, to speak in, um, and it's a great pleasure to be here, and we're very grateful to all of you for in inviting us. We're here on an amazingly interesting day. There are bilateral talks going on in Havana uh, as we speak. The Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America, Roberta Jacobson, is meeting with Josefina Vidal today, and, uh, and these talks are going on, and the pace is picking up uh, as the Summit of the Americas uh, approaches uh, uh, the second week of April in Panama, in which President Obama will attend, and for the first time, uh, a Cuban leader, Raul Castro, will attend. This will be the first occasion in which the two presidents are, are in a, a conference room. They'll be surrounded by very supportive other Latin American leaders, but um, uh, I'm sure they will get a chance uh, to talk among themselves. Uh, and uh, and uh, President Obama would like to go into that meeting, obviously, having uh, picked up the pace of, uh, of these talks between the two countries to actually normalize diplomatic relations. Now, of course, this started, this uh, countdown towards this normalization started on December 17th, uh, 2014 of last year, a historic, historic day in Cuba. They now refer to this day as Diecisiete Day. Uh, and um, uh, if you didn't know better, you'd think it was an apartment number. But, uh, um, but uh, in Cuba, it's, uh, it is uh, a day that is widely referred to. I had to have this photograph taken just to prove that I was actually in Cuba on that day. Uh, Bill Leo Grant and I were there together uh, for a big conference on U.S.-Cuban relations, uh, ironically on uh, you know, kind of areas of mutual collaboration and mutual interest. Um, and it was just an extraordinary historic moment to, to be there, to see how the Cubans reacted. Um, of course, the return of the three Cuban spies from the United States uh, led to kind of almost immediate celebrations there among many people. Um, and then it, it, to set in while we were still there among the Cuban people that there was going to be rather extraordinary kind of economic opportunities that might come out of improved relations with the United States. And the very next morning, I remember getting into a cab, and the driver said to me, oh, I've been sitting around with the other taxi drivers, and we've been talking about how we're going to get a Ford van. Uh, and, um, uh, and I thought that was uh, really, really uh, uh, interesting that those expectations have, have gone up so high so quickly. Um, President Obama, of course, called Raul Castro the day before, uh, you know, uh, 16D, uh, uh, December 16th, uh, and uh, held the very first substantive conversation uh, with the Cuban president uh, between the United States presidents and the Cuban presidents in more than 55 years uh, since the revolution. Um, and that's where they finalized um, uh, kind of the details of when the planes would leave, how they would take off, return, the swap of prisoners. Um, and what uh, the United States would announce. Uh, initially, uh, the uh, President of the United States was going to go first at noon to make an announcement about these changes, and then President Castro was going to go on at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. But the Cubans, for the sake of being even Stephen, uh, mutual respect, changed this. And they both went on, of course, simultaneously at 12 o'clock uh, the next day. And this was all finalized uh, at, this, at this phone call. Um, there was somebody there that, that said, we understood that history was being made. 
And it's true. It was an absolutely momentous day uh, in the history of U.S. foreign policy and certainly in the history of, of, of bilateral relations. Now, uh, a lot of people said to, to, to me, and I think to Bill too, you know, you were in Cuba on that day. You must have known this was happening. <laughs> and, and, um, and then they said, and then your book came out just a few weeks before this happened. You must have known this was happening. Uh, and of course, we didn't quite know it was happening, um, although there were a lot of hints and suspicions. But, uh, but 10 years ago, when we sat down to uh, start pulling this book together, we, 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 uh, we, we projected, if you will, we predicted, we projected uh, that in 10 years there would be a president of the United States that uh, would be willing to do this, that the conditions would be propitious, uh, and, uh, uh, and that the history needed to be in one place to create uh, a sense of precedence, to create a sense of historic foundation, and for the lessons uh, to be available uh, to the team that was going to do this. Um, and so we set out to create a roadmap uh, of secret talks, of dialogue, um, uh, that would be useful for a, a president such as Barack Obama uh, to use uh, and to, um, uh, to, to, to draw on. Not only to, to draw on the lessons as uh, he or she negotiated uh, with, with the Cubans, uh, but as well to, to, to make it clear that talking to the Cubans wasn't some heretical, crazy idea. Uh, it was something that, that uh, pretty much every president had done uh, uh, going all the way back to John F. Kennedy. And this is, in fact, the case. Um, you know, uh, Barack Obama is the first president to succeed uh, in a breakthrough of uh, changing policy uh, and uh, moving towards normalization with, with, the, with the Cubans since the break in diplomatic relations in January of 1961 at, during the final days of the Eisenhower administration. But he's not the first president to try. Uh, and there have been several presidents who have actually uh, sat down to, to, to work with the Cubans uh, on changing the framework of relations. Uh, they've accomplished um, kind of a different levels of, 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 of successes and of course all of them eventually failed in the ultimate goal that they had to actually get back to a, a normal state of diplomatic and, uh, and overall relations. But they certainly gave it a hearty uh, try. Um, and that was one of the things that we found out during the 10 years of, of, of researching uh, this book. The second takeaway we had from the book that was rather extraordinary is that for all his anti-American rhetoric, uh, and for all that Fidel Castro today would like you to think that uh, he's kind of, you know, not that enthusiastic about what's happening right now, the truth is that he himself reached out to almost every single president very early on in their terms uh, to see if better relations uh, were, were possible. And I'm just going to show you very quickly a series of declassified documents that, that, that illustrate uh, this history of, of Castro's interest. Uh, this first document is the first two pages of, of a very famous memorandum of conversation between Che Guevara uh, and Richard Goodwin, a meeting that they had all night long in uh, Montevideo, uh, Uruguay in August of 1961, five months after the Bay of Pigs. And this is, a, this is so important. Five months after the most flagrant act of U.S. aggression against Cuba, a paramilitary invasion, um, Fidel Castro was willing to actually broach the issue of peaceful coexistence, of a modus vivendi, as uh, Che Guevara put it. And, uh, and uh, Fidel and Che were willing to practice what in the book we referred to as cigar diplomacy. Uh, che brought a beautiful box of mahogany, a uh, beautiful mahogany box of cigars uh, for uh, Goodwin to take back to the president, and he, he did take them back, and Kennedy pulled out one and clipped it and started smoking it, and then he stopped and handed it to Goodwin and said, maybe you should take the first puff. <laughs> uh, to which Goodwin replied, it's too late now, Mr. President. But... This gives you a sense of, uh, of, of the uh, willingness of Cuba to move forward. And in fact, one of the things that Che Guevara said that was most significant to, to Richard Goodwin at that meeting was, thank you for the Bay of Pigs. You allowed us to consolidate the revolution and transformed us from an aggrieved little country into an equal. 
Uh, and the meeting progressed on that basis. As an equal, uh, we think that we can um, actually arrive at uh, at least a peaceful coexistence between our system and your and your system. Um, and that was the first real effort. After Kennedy uh, was killed, and I should say parenthetically that uh, that talks between Kennedy and Castro kind of did progress to the day that. Uh, uh, that uh, the assassination took place. Um, but just after Kennedy was killed, um, Fidel Castro sent a private note with a journalist back to Lyndon Johnson saying, did you know we were in talks with President Kennedy? This is how secret these things were, is that he really didn't even know if Johnson knew. Uh, and he wanted to say to him, we were in talks. If you know about them, do you want to continue them? Uh, and um, this note was kept secret. Nobody knew about it for 35 years. Um, but it was uh, given uh, to a reporter on February 12, 1964. Johnson had uh, been president for less than three months. And Castro was already reaching out to see what might be possible. Um, he reached out to Richard Nixon 10 days after Nixon's inauguration. And here you had a situation in which uh, the president, the new president of the United States was somebody that Fidel was very familiar with. Uh, he had met with him for a couple of hours in April of 1959. Uh, the meeting, as, as Bill has written so colorfully in, in the book, uh, in the Eisenhower chapter, uh, went badly. Um, uh, Fidel did not emerge uh, very keen on, on Richard Nixon, and, and Richard Nixon uh, emerged not very keen on Fidel Castro, as you can imagine, um, and then went on to become one of the kind of true proponents of overthrowing Castro. Uh, but um, even so, Castro called in the Swiss ambassador and basically sent a message to the Nixon administration in its first two weeks in office uh, saying, there are things I'd like to talk about. As Henry Kissinger wrote to the president, this is, uh, is one of Ken Kissinger's aides, wrote to Kissinger to present to the president, this is kind of a, a gesture of detente. Uh, and that was most extraordinary. And even with Ronald Reagan, one of the arch uh, cold warriors of, of, of his day, Fidel Castro repeatedly uh, reached out. Now, I mentioned that there were several presidents that tried to broach the issue of changing relations. And John F. Kennedy, ironically, was one of them. He is the president who uh, was completely kind of tied by the narrative of history to, uh, to um, uh, aggression against Cuba. He gave the green light for the Bay of Pigs. He authorized Operation Mongoose. A number of the assassination attempts against Castro that took place took place under his watch. Uh, he uh, imposed the trade embargo, and during the Cuban Missile Crisis, of course, he massed forces to uh, completely um, uh, obliterate Cuba if, 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 if needed. Luckily, uh, his head and wiser heads prevailed, and that didn't happen. But after the Missile Crisis, he emerged thinking that perhaps it might be wiser uh, to uh, take a different approach towards, towards Cuba. And one of his top aides kind of sent this memo saying, why don't we try the sweet approach as opposed to the approach of covert nastiness uh, and see if we can entice Castro over to us. Um, and, you know, one could probably sit and think that maybe Barack Obama got a memo like this at some point early in his administration, too. Uh, but um, this was a, a serious effort. Um, Kennedy understood that it was politically dicey uh, to, to reach out to Castro. Um, the CIA opposed any type of rapprochement. They were very invested with the exile groups and with the intelligence services of all the dictatorships of Latin America to try and overthrow Castro. So Kennedy, in order to communicate with Castro, had to use secret intermediaries. He used a lawyer, James Donovan. Uh, he used two reporters, uh, Lisa Howard, who was the first female uh, news correspondent for ABC News. Uh, and then, literally on the day that Kennedy was killed, uh, he had an emissary, a French journalist named Jean Daniel, sharing kind of a message of possible reconciliation uh, with, uh, with Castro. And the word came in that Kennedy had been killed, and Castro famously now turned to, to Jean Daniel and said, there goes your mission of peace. And in truth, for 10 years, there were no other real missions of peace to change uh, relations. 
But Kissinger confronted a situation somewhat similar to what Barack Obama has now confronted with Latin America, a situation in which Latin America was rebelling against uh, U.S. pressures to isolate Cuba. Uh, Latin American countries today have said to Obama, we're not going to have another summit of the Americas without Cuba's involvement, and now Cuba's going to be involved in the next summit. Um, in Kissinger's day, the message to him was, we are going to restore our political and economic relations with Cuba. We are going to vote to lift the multilateral sanctions imposed at the OAS in the early 60s uh, under pressure from the United States. You can do what you want, um, but uh, you know, you're only going to uh, uh, really hurt relations with the rest of the region if you oppose this, and in the end, you're going to lose. Kissinger tried to turn uh, necessity into a virtue, and he thought this might make a good bargaining chip with the Cubans. And so he, uh, and he also, uh, pragmatically speaking, uh, thought that uh, having Castro kind of closer might uh, create incentives for him not to screw around in parts of the world that Kissinger cared about, uh, Latin America and Africa, uh, famous last words. But um, he actually designed a um, an aid memoir for the very first meeting between the, the, uh, the very first secret meeting, which ironically took place quite in the open in the cafeteria of LaGuardia Airport uh, in January of 1975, um, he designed a, uh, an aid memoir, which you see here, um, which was in tone, you know, pitch perfect. Uh, it, it basically uh, said to the Cubans, um, we have differences of ideological positions, uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't coexist. If we can have detente with China, we can certainly have a detente in the Caribbean. And this first meeting led to a series of other meetings, including a very significant negotiating session at the Pierre Hotel in the summer of 1975. You see the first page of the, of the memorandum of conversation of a three-hour meeting that took place there. So, um, uh, those talks went forward. And I, I think, and I think the chapter in the book suggests, that, that, that this could have been a moment in which relations were actually normalized. But Fidel Castro had a, a different mission that was somewhat more important to him at that point than uh, normal relations with the United States. It's not that he didn't want normal relations with the United States, he did. But he also wanted to be leader of the third world, and he also wanted to uh, advance his revolutionary principles. And so, um, when he received a request from Augustine Nieto in, in, in Angola to, to send Cuban troops uh, to fight back CIA-supported and South African-supported uh, guerrillas, um, he, he um, uh, took that opportunity. He sent troops, and then he kind of uh, shamed the Soviet Union into, into helping him uh, with logistics thereafter. Um, and so the talks uh, between the United States and Cuba uh, during the Ford administration fell apart. Jimmy Carter picked up where Henry Kissinger left off. Uh, he was the first president to actually say, we should normalize relations with Cuba, and I'm ordering the national security bureaucracy to take steps towards that goal. Uh, in the first six months after he signed this directive, uh, these uh, interest sections that are now about to be transformed into embassies uh, were actually created. Um, and a number of secret talks took place uh, during the Carter administration. They took place in Cuernavaca, Mexico. They took place in Atlanta, in New York City. Um, uh, and even a team representing Carter, uh, the Carter White House and the Carter State Department, uh, went to Havana to meet face-to-face -face with Fidel Castro. But the talks always got back to the same issue, a precondition the United States had. Get your troops out of Africa and we're willing to have normal relations and lift the embargo. And Castro was not willing uh, to uh, negotiate on those terms. Um, we have the declassified memorandum of conversation between him and Fidel Castro and Peter Tarnoff and Robert Pastor, which uh, Castro basically says, you know, uh, I don't send my people to the United States to tell your president how to conduct his foreign policy. And I don't understand why you think you can come here and tell me how to conduct my foreign policy. There seems to be two different laws, uh, for one for big countries and one for small countries. And I just don't accept that. Uh, and the revolution won't accept that. Uh, we think you should lift the embargo. You imposed it unilaterally, and you should lift it uh, unilaterally. Um, and that's where, that's where things ended. If Carter had had a second term, he might actually uh, 
have normalized relations. Uh, in the book, we uh, kind of reveal some of the secret meetings uh, that took place right at the end of the Carter administration, in which Carter sent emissaries to Castro and said, if you end the Mario boat lift, we will talk about uh, normal relations in the second term. And of course, there was no second term in the end. Now, Barack Obama uh, is very much like Jimmy Carter, I think, philosophically. Um, they both came into office feeling uh, that it's better to have your enemies close uh, rather than distant, uh, and that talking to hostile states is preferable uh, than uh, going to war with them. Uh, and so you'll recall that Barack Obama, when he was running for president, um, uh, both during the primaries with Hillary Clinton and during the actual campaign, said, I would sit down with Raul Castro. And now he's about to do that. Uh, and he had one big obstacle uh, to get kind of to that goal, and that was the imprisonment of USAID subcontractor Alan Gross um, and the imprisonment of these spies, uh, uh, they're uh, called heroes in Cuba, uh, who were still here in the United States. And then there was one mystery man who none of us knew about, and he's the one who's not identified in this picture, Rolando uh, Saraf Trujillo. Uh, and it turns out that the CIA very much wanted him back. Uh, he uh, appears to have been one of their top informants, moles inside the Cuban Interior Ministry uh, in the 1990s. He was identified and arrested by uh, Cuban counterintelligence, uh, I think around 1995 or 96, um, and had been in prison ever since. And then the CIA, which has always wanted its people back, just like the Cuban Interior Ministry wanted their people back, um, jumped at this opportunity to, to, to get him and and um, this is what a lot of the negotiations between the Obama administration and uh, Raul Castro's people were, were, were all about. This was the headlines of the Communist Party newspaper the day after this announcement. Uh, they have returned, uh, all five of the Cuban spies there with Raul Castro um, and the pictures of the two presidents on television. It was quite the momentous day. And now we're going to face a time when these two men uh, meet again, uh, and there'll be, I think, a whole other round of photographs of them shaking hands. Um, and of course, between now and then and thereafter, um, there are quite a few issues uh, that have to be resolved before we get to the goal that, uh, that has been laid out, normal, bilateral, diplomatic, and then normal relations. And there's a long bridge to cross there, um, and in order to really understand what that bridge is, I'm turning over the podium to my esteemed colleague, William Leo Grant. Thank you, Peter. Um, and let me add my thanks to the Wilson Center for having us and for all of you for, for uh, coming this afternoon. A number of lessons come out of this long history that Peter has just given you a quick summary of, and, and the concluding chapter in the book lays them out. But I want to mention a couple of them that I think are relevant going forward. And one of the most obvious is that talking to the Cubans, despite 50 years of hostility, um, is not abnormal and has never been abnormal. Every president since Eisenhower has found reason to talk with the Cubans, either about the broad issue of normalizing relations or about narrower issues of mutual interest like migration, cooperation on the environment, cooperation on fighting narcotics trafficking. The second uh, related lesson is that uh, agreements are achievable. Uh, there are over a dozen agreements that Cuba and the United States has reached over the course of the last 50 years. Um, and related again to that, a third lesson is that the Cubans keep the agreements that they make. They have a very good record of actually uh, delivering on the commitments that they've made in these formal agreements. However, the Cubans are not prepared and have never been prepared since Che Guevara's meeting with Richard Goodwin to negotiate about their internal arrangements, about the shape of their economic and the shape of their political system. These are matters they regard as internal affairs uh, and part of their national sovereignty, and they're simply not willing to discuss them. Uh, and finally, probably the most important lesson, and I think that one that President Obama grasped, was that Cubans insist on being treated with respect as an equal country. Uh, they're very sensitive after half a century of being a virtual colony of the United States from 1898 to 1959. They're very sensitive to any slight to their national dignity or their national sovereignty. And Raul Castro has said a number of 
times. He's willing to talk with the United States about any issue at all, as long as it's on the basis of mutual respect and without a shadow on the national sovereignty of the island. So President Obama came to office, uh, as Peter said, saying that the old policy hadn't worked and needed to change. But for the first six years, there wasn't much progress uh, on that change. Uh, then, after 18 months of secret negotiations, on December 17th, we had the announcement of the intention to normalize bilateral relations. Uh, and the president has said repeatedly that the logic behind his decision was that the old policy simply hadn't worked. Hadn't worked for 54 years, and so it had reached its expiration date, as he said famously. Um, but that suggests the question of, well, why did it take 54 years for us to realize that this policy wasn't working? What held it up for such a long period of time? And I think the answer is, and the answer that we found in writing the book, was that at moments when uh, the United States was interested in normalizing relations, uh, particularly in the Ford-Kissinger period and the Carter period, uh, Cuba was interested as well but had higher priorities in its foreign policy and wasn't willing to set those aside as the price of normal relations with the United States, and particularly its solidarity with its allies in Africa. On the other hand, at moments when Cuba was most interested in normalizing relations, after the end of the Cold War when they lost their partnership and support of the Soviet Union, uh, the United States was much less interested, in part because Cuba had uh, ceased to be a very important issue in foreign policy. It was a small island, it wasn't uh, the focal point of the Cold War anymore, and there were domestic political constraints in the Cuban-American community's opposition to any change in policy. So what's happened, I think, recently is that um, s the, the cost calculation of the, the cost and benefit of changing the policy has shifted in recent years. First of all, the diplomatic cost in Latin America of maintaining the status quo has gone up fairly dramatically in uh, the last five or six years. The president saw this at the uh, Cartagena Summit of the Americas uh, in 2012 when the issue of Cuba dominated the agenda and actually prevented the United States from getting its important issues uh, on the table for full discussion. And uh, Latin America made it clear that there would be no sixth or seventh summit, rather, uh, if Cuba was not included. The second thing that changed was the Cuban-American community itself. It's never been as monolithic as portrayed by some, but there's no doubt that attitudes have become much more moderate in the community over time. We see that in opinion polls going all the way back to the 1990s. And the reason is fairly simple. The most hardline conservative elements in the community are those, uh, those exiles who came in the 1960s and 1970s. They left for political reasons. They lost everything when they came. But people who've come more recently, since 1980 and even more so since the end of the Cold War, have come more for economic than political reasons. They've maintained relations with family on the island. They travel back to visit them. They send them remittances. And for them, normal state-to-state -state relations are benefit, not something to be avoided. And so the attitude in the community has moved now so that a majority of Cuban Americans actually favor normal diplomatic relations, an end to the embargo, and a lifting of all, all travel uh, restrictions. Now, for a long time, that didn't manifest itself in votes. And the reason is fairly simple. Those exiles who came in the 60s and 70s, 90% of them are naturalized U.S. citizens. 80% of them are registered to vote, and they have very high turnout rates. People who've come since the end of the Cold War, since 1990, only 30% of them are naturalized citizens. Many of them are not registered to vote, and they have very low rates of turnout. So even though this new group constitutes a larger segment of the Cuban-American community than the old guard, they're only 15% of the Cuban electorate, Cuban-American electorate, as opposed to the old guard, which is still about 49%. The rest are uh, Cuban-American, the children of, of the exiles, that is to say Cuban-Americans born in the United States. And they also have a more moderate set of views than their parents 
and their grandparents. And this was seen in Obama's uh, 2008 election when he carried 35 percent of the Cuban American community in South Florida, which was a record for Democrats, matched only by Bill Clinton, who ran uh, his reelection campaign in 1996, having signed the Helms Burton legislation. So he ran on a hardline policy towards Cuba. Um, and then in 2012, President Obama won half the Cuban American vote, an unprecedented showing for a Democratic uh, candidate. On the Cuban side, uh, there's reason for change as well. Uh, Raul Castro, early on in his administration, began to lift uh, regulations that made the life of ordinary Cubans uh, uh, unpleasant. Uh, he allowed the opening of small businesses. He lifted the restrictions on cell phones, on computers. He took away the Tarjeta Blanca, which was a, an, a permit that Cubans needed to get in order to be able to travel abroad. He opened a market for the sale of houses and cars. Uh, and generally, since 2000, has embarked upon a program of economic restructuring to move Cuba away from the kind of hyper-centralized Soviet model of central planning toward a more market socialism on the model of Vietnam and China. Uh, even Fidel himself said not too long ago, the Cuban model doesn't even work for us anymore. <laughs> so Raul sees long-term normalization with the United States as an important element in the growth of the Cuban economy. Cuban economists say that they need two and a half billion dollars of direct foreign investment annually in order to sustain the rates of economic growth that they're seeking. The United States is an obvious source for that kind of investment if the embargo were to be lifted. Uh, the Cuban economy is now very much centered on tourism. Well, the United States is the largest source of tourists going to the Caribbean, and estimates are that if the embargo were lifted tomorrow, as many as three million tourists a year would go from the United States to Cuba. That would be, that would double the number of tourists going to Cuba. And the truth is they really don't have the capacity to absorb it at the moment. But in the long run, there's an obvious economic incentive for Cuba in this process of restructuring their economy to normalize relations with the United States. Uh, in just in the same way that Gorbachev wanted to end the Cold War so he could focus on perestroika, I think Raul Castro wanted to end the Cold War in the Caribbean so he could focus on what they call the updating of the Cuban economy. So what happens next? Well, it's important to recognize there are two sets of uh, talks or two sets of dialogue going on. One is simply about restoring normal diplomatic relations, uh, and that's the focus of the conversations that are going on in Havana today. Um, there's an expectation that this is going to move reasonably quickly and may very well be accomplished before the Summit of the Americas in April, although time is getting short. There are some issues um, uh, that they still need to resolve, and we may know better in an hour or two whether they've made any progress on it. The other, uh, the other venue of talks, if you will, is about normalizing the overall bilateral relationship. And that means fundamentally an end to U.S. economic sanctions, but it also means doing away with a number of policies that are uh, the manifestations of the old policy of hostility and regime change. Uh, this is going to take a long time, years in all likelihood, because a number, lifting a number of these sanctions require action by Congress. And the Republican leadership in Congress has a narrative, I think it's fair to say, that Obama is weak on foreign policy, and therefore they're not likely to do anything on the Cuba issue that will give him a success. Um, so the issues that's, that are being debated now uh, around the restoration of diplomatic relations are uh, taking Cuba off the terrorism list. Uh, the Cubans have not made that a precondition for normal diplomatic relations, but they've he underscored it as very important to them. Um, it, their status on the list is under review at the moment. Uh, there's every expectation that that review will conclude they shouldn't be on the list and that the president will in fact take them off. Uh, but that's still an issue that's unresolved. Uh, a, a perhaps diffi more difficult one is, is unfettered diplomatic travel around the island for U.S. diplomats. The Vene uh, Vienna Convention of, on Diplomatic Relations does specify unfettered travel, uh, but the Cuban position is that U.S. diplomats 
in the past in traveling around the island have engaged in activities incompatible with their diplomatic status, which is to say providing material assistance and support to Cuban dissidents. Um, so that's, that's got to be resolved. And finally, there's the issue of Cuba being able to have access to simple banking services. Right now, there's no bank uh, that is willing to handle the account of the Cuban mission in the United States, and therefore they have to do all their transactions in cash, which is obviously not something sustainable over the long run. Um, in terms of broader negotiations, one of the things I think we're going to see in the relatively near future is a series of agreements on issues of mutual interest. These are things that have been under discussion for the last couple of years and, in fact, uh, are probably ripe for final agreement. Uh, the restoration of normal postal service, uh, the, uh, an, a new agreement on cooperation on uh, counter-narcotics, uh, a new agreement on environmental protection, on oil spill prevention and mitigation. Um, and there are also now uh, established working groups of experts that the two countries have set up that are working on the issue of claims because, of course, uh, we have eight, seven to eight billion dollars worth of claims against Cuba for property nationalized back in 1959 and 1960, and they have something like a trillion dollars in claims against the United States for the damage done by the embargo and the CIA's secret war. So the, there's a working group on claims to try to sort that out. There's a working group on human rights uh, where I think the two sides will trade conceptions of human rights, uh, which won't make a lot of progress, I don't think, initially. But then we'll get down to the business of looking at international protocols that both sides have agreed to to see whether or not some progress might be made on how those are carried out. Uh, there is a working group on law enforcement cooperation, which is going to deal with this issue of fugitives, which is a sensitive one in the United States. But I don't think it's going to be able to resolve the issue of fugitives in Cuba who have been given political asylum, people like Joanne Chesimard and William Morales. Uh, rather, I think it's going to deal with cu fugitives who are common criminals. Um, and, and I think that there is uh, precedent for making good progress on that. Uh, there is a working group on civil aviation to try to uh, expand uh, U.S. flights to, and, and, uh, to Cuba and also so that regular U.S. airlines can, can fly down there as opposed to it being solely charters. And then there uh, is a working group on human trafficking, uh, which is a problem because, in part because of the Cuban Adjustment Act which allows Cubans landing in the United States to adjust their status at the end of a year and become permanent residents. Uh, Cuba has long seen this as one of the uh, spurs for human trafficking off the island. Uh, and there, ha there is a, uh, a, a not small industry of people who are engaged in forging documents and smuggling people on fast boats, uh, not so much north to Florida but to Mexico and then people make their way through Mexico um, and arrive at the Texas border and, and, and uh, then claim uh, status as immig landed immigrants. There are a long, there's a long list of issues in disagreement still between the two countries that uh, will have to be resolved in order for fully normal relations uh, to be achieved. One, of course, is the embargo itself. The embargo is inscribed in law by the 1996 Helms-Burton Act and can only be lifted in its entirety by an act of Congress. The president can use his licensing authority to poke holes in it, and he's done that. But uh, the, the entire embargo uh, will take uh, a repeal of that legislation. Uh, the democracy promotion programs that the United States has uh, carried out in Cuba uh, since the 1990s, the programs that led to the arrest of Alan Gross, uh, continue. And they continue in, at the moment at least, in pretty much the same format that they have always had. They involve assistance to dissidents and efforts to promote opposition to the current Cuban government. Uh, we are still broadcasting TV and Radio Marti to Cuba. Uh, again, as a way of uh, promoting opposition to the Cuban government. We have something called, a uh, little known program, called the Cuban Medical Personnel Parole Program, under which uh, the United States will give fast-track residency and citizenship 
to Cuban health care workers working abroad on humanitarian missions if they defect to the United States. Obviously an obstacle to global health cooperation on issues like Ebola in West Africa. Um, there's the fugitive issue that I've already mentioned. Uh, and of course, there's Guantanamo. Uh, the Cubans want it back. Uh, the United States at the moment is not willing to even discuss that issue. And frankly, until the president can succeed in closing the detention center there, there's really not much likelihood that we're going to see much success on that front. Um, well, despite the obstacles that, that still remain, I think it's fair to say that the, the general reaction to December 17 uh, was enthusiastic, not only in Cuba, where we saw how ordinary Cubans reacted. Around the hemisphere, the uh, praise for the agreement was effusive and universal. Um, it, the uh, European Union, which has long been at odds with the United States in terms of policy towards Cuba, also weighed in uh, praising it right away. And of course, then the Pope gave it his blessing. Um, public opinion in the United States has been very favorable. There have been five opinion polls nationwide now uh, showing all of them over 60 percent favorable uh, for the various elements of, of the president's policy. And even polling in the Cuban-American community has shown that about half the Cuban-American community is supportive of what the president has done. Uh, opposition and criticism has come mostly from congressional Republicans, um, especially uh, Rubio Cruz and Jeb Bush, uh, not surprisingly, presidential contenders, who are appealing to the conservative Republican Cuban-American base in South Florida, and also, as I say, uh, to this narrative that the Republican Party has that the president is weak in foreign policy. Uh, there are some things congressional conservatives can do to block progress on this. They can hold up the confirmation of whoever the president um, nominates as ambassador to Cuba once relations are restored, most likely the current chief of mission, uh, Jeff De Laurentiis, who's an outstanding foreign service officer. Uh, he'll be hard to... Uh, uh, to criticize on his merits, but I think it wouldn't surprise me at all if he's held up simply as opposition to the policy. They could try and will try to block any legislation repealing the embargo or repealing the travel ban. There's a, still a travel ban on tourism to Cuba. Uh, they may try to block Cuba's removal from the terrorism list, but they would need to be able to override a presidential veto. So that's not, like, that's not too likely. And finally, come fall, they may try to put some riders on, on must-pass appropriations legislation to try to roll back or prevent the implementation of some aspects of this policy. So there's still a long, long way to go, many obstacles uh, in the path. Uh, this is going to be, for sure, a one step forward, two steps back kind of business that's going to last for several years. What, this shouldn't surprise us. It, from, from the time of the announcement uh, that uh, we were going to normalize relations with Vietnam, it took uh, a couple of decades before that was complete. Um, this is, in, in my mind, as historic a break with the past as Nixon's 1972 trip to China. And it wasn't until Bill Clinton was president of the United States that we finally fully normalized our relationship with China. Uh, but while it may take a long time, uh, I think we're now on a path toward reconciliation between the two countries, which offers not only a, a brighter future in the bilateral relationship, but hopefully a brighter future for Cuba as well. Thank you very much. Thank you both uh, so much. Um, uh, perfect um, uh, presentations, perfectly timed and uh, exemplary in their, their um, excellence and survey uh, nature. So let's go straight to, to questions and, and comments on your part. Yeah. And well, please wait for the microphone and uh, if you could state your name and affiliation if you like. Uh, Timothy Towell, retired Foreign Service Officer from the Kennedy Administration into the Clinton Administration. On the Cuban desk in the 60s, wonderful time. Uh, Deputy Wayne Smith at the intersection at 79 and 80, so we gave South Florida an extra half million <coughs> good positive citizens. Uh, and, I just, and I follow Cuba on and off, and I just came back with a bunch of geriatric retired FSOs to look at 
at least historic breakthrough. And I must say, I was astonished because I go back periodically and talk to people in Spanish. And I was absolutely astonished that everybody, bartenders, people on the street, uh, the MINREX, the foreign ministry, the U.S. interest section, everybody, the hotel characters, are in favor of this historic breakthrough and talk about it that way. The only sort of intellectual uh, saying it'll take on, if, on a few years were, as you said, Bill, were uh, people in foreign embassies who I thought were spooks and were, you know, <laughs> yes, but, and, you know, being scholarly and very thoughtful and all that stuff. <laughs> um, and the Minrex people smiled. We met uh, Mrs., uh, I've mean, even forgotten her name, but what an what a attractive, smart, beautiful English and charming lady, and her deputy used to be her boss, who we used to know up here on 16th Street, uh, at the intersection, a wonderful guy. Only time he growled at us is when we raised, when some of our troublemakers, not me, <laughs> raised the issue of meddling around in the internal affairs of Cuba, and then the issue of uh, uh, our list of what they owe us and their trillion dollar list of what we owe them for the blockade. Um, but I come, remember a State Department and U.S. government that coordinated things. And I was reading today about saying, gee whiz, this is an historic breakthrough. The Europeans love it. Everybody in the world loves it. In Latin America, who's used to Yankee imperialism, loves it. Now we're trying to finish all this work today. <laughs> You'll get a call before the close of business to, to make this a real success to brag about in Panama and have, you know, pictures like that where everybody's hugging everybody. And now because we're crapping all over the Venezuelans at the same time and using language that we try and justify saying it's in the law, it's just bureaucratic stuff that low-level people put in paper, uh, is that going to put a damper, a serious damper on this historic breakthrough? Because we're going to need all the uh, positive energy and enthusiasm and applause to move through the real heavy issues that are going to take years and years, as you pointed out, to solve. Well, um, so first let me say that I think uh, I, I, we had the same experience in Cuba about the just universal excitement about this uh, when it was first announced. I actually think that the heightened expectations pose something of a problem for the Cuban government. Uh, they've been telling people for 50 years that the U.S. embargo is why the economy is a wreck. Uh, Raul has done that less than Fidel did, admittedly. But um, there was a lot of expectations among ordinary people that now that relations were going to be normalized, the embargo was going to be lifted and, and the economy was going to get better and standard of living was going to go up all really fast. And of course, that's not going to happen. And so we could already see in the weeks after the announcement the Cuban government trying to dampen down those expectations a little bit. With regard to Venezuela, um, uh, Roberta Jacobson, I assume it was Roberta Jacobson, gave a background briefing uh, at the State Department the uh, day before yesterday, I believe it was, in advance of, of this meeting going down. Someone asked her this question. And she said very emphatically that progress in the relationship with Cuba was not dependent upon what was going on in Venezuela and that the United States did not expect its sanctions against Venezuela or events in Venezuela to upset this process. So they very clearly want to avoid that problem. Now, of course, the Cubans have come out very strongly in favor of Venezuela uh, in, in the midst of this. But I will say that I don't think Cuba wants to see the bilateral process derailed by Venezuela either. So I think it will go forward. Yeah, I, I do think, though, that your point that it could kind of intrude upon uh, a party at the summit of the Americas um, is, um, is, a, is a valid one. Um, and it kind of depends, you know, whether Maduro has any case at all or whether the rest of Latin America, much like I think so many of us do, um, think that he's just trying to divert attention from, from his own uh, increasingly failing situation. So we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out there. Because um, certainly the Cubans don't want to be pushed into a situation where publicly in front of the rest of Latin America they're forced to choose between the United States or Venezuela. Um, and 
um, I don't think any of us quite anticipated this situation. I'm not exactly sure why and what happened to lead the United States, to lead the White House to make this declaration and decree last week. Uh, but um, it certainly has a potential to, 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 to kind of hurt the, the progress. It throws summit. the damper on the party, for right. sure. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Could I just ask a couple of questions and we'll get to you, just for clarification. Um, uh, you, talked, uh, you talked about democracy promotion and regime change being part of the old policy. Um, but uh, so you're saying that was not at all part of the strategic calculus of the Obama administration in terms of um, the economic changes, uh, sort of ospolitik like leading to political changes in Cuba as well. Um, second question, just, just for clarification, does Cuba support terrorism or is it on the list simply to put a stain on, 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 the, um, on the country's um, policy? And thirdly, could you, you, you went through the administrations, Peter, um, very, um, very nicely, but the Clinton administration was sort of missing in this if I um, um, didn't miss anything. If you could talk a little bit about the Clinton administration and perhaps if that might tell us anything about uh, um, Hillary Clinton's um, ideas on the subject. Mm. Well, why don't I start and then we'll turn it to Peter for Clinton. Is that, right. and you may have some, he may have some thoughts on the other questions as well. Uh, I, there's no doubt that the president has justified his policy uh, being uh, as one aimed at empowering the Cuban people. And he, he believes uh, that a, a normal bilateral relationship, uh, particularly an expansion of uh, relations at the societal level, uh, will lead to an internal dynamic in Cuba, which will, in fact, in the long run, produce a more open political and economic system. But I think that is fundamentally different from the previous policy, which was aimed at, particularly under the Bush administration, aimed at accelerating the deterioration of the current regime, leading to its, its uh, sudden demise, if you will. Uh, Roger Noriega, who was Assistant Secretary of State for Latin America during the Bush administration, said at one point, um, we're not aiming for stability in Cuba. Cuba has had too much stability. Um, and in contrast, in his speech on December 17, President Obama said that the United States was not seeking the collapse of the Cuban regime, that a collapse would not be in the interest of the United States, and that we've had uh, quite enough experience with failed states and trying to put the pieces back together again. So I think that, I think that um, although the United States clearly has still, as its long-term objective, an expansion of democracy in Cuba, uh, the approach to getting from here to there is very different and is focused more on trying to exert a positive influence on the internal dynamics on the island rather than trying to coerce the Cuban regime into collapse. Um, on the terrorism list, I, I do not believe, uh, and I think most people don't believe that it belongs on the list anymore. Um, in the last report that came out from the Department of State, the only three issues that were mentioned were uh, Cuba providing sanctuary to members of the ETA, the Basque ETA, uh, the FARC from Colombia, and some U.S. fugitives. Now, of course, FARC is in Cuba because Cuba, is, along with Norway, is hosting negotiations to try to bring an end to the war in Colombia between FARC and the Colombian government. Uh, ETA, uh, some of the members of the ETA who are in Cuba are there as a result of an agreement between Fidel Castro and Felipe Gonzalez when he was Prime Minister of Spain, although I will say Spain has asked for the extradition just recently of two of those people. Um, more importantly, they have not, those people in Cuba have not been active in promoting terrorism while they've been in Cuba, which is the definition of giving sanctuary to terrorists in the law that establishes the terrorism list. Finally, the U.S. fugitives, um, their actions, the actions of which they, they have been convicted may very well count as terrorism, but they don't count as international terrorism under that legislation, which says that international terrorism is acts of terrorism across national boundaries. These are U.S. citizens who committed acts of terrorism in the United States. So uh, there really isn't any longer, if there ever was, a rationale for Cuba being on the list. 
And I just should add that, that uh, Ronald Reagan put uh, Cuba on the list uh, in 1982, and he did so right after uh, a, a couple of very secret back-channel meetings between his representatives and Cuban representatives, in which uh, Reagan's message was, we want you to get out of Central America. Uh, we want you to stop supporting uh, the guerrilla movements in El Salvador, and we want uh, your teams uh, you know, out of Nicaragua. Um, and when Fidel Castro didn't throw up his hands and say, if that's what you want, of course, uh, Cuba was put on the uh, terrorism list. And it was, was quite clear that, that uh, the, the main objective in doing this was to obfuscate the difference between uh, supporting revolution and supporting international terrorism uh, and to figure out some way, uh, and with the embargo there weren't that many ways, to punish Cuba further for not kowtowing to uh, the demands of the, of the Reagan administration. Um, and um, the, the story of those talks are, is, are told in the book uh, in, 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 some, in some really interesting detail, as is the story of talks uh, between the United States and Cuba during the Clinton administration. I didn't include Clinton in my presentation in part because he never quite arrived at, uh, uh, at, at talks to, to change fundamentally the relationship between the United States and Cuba, even though he took steps to progress towards poking holes in the embargo, uh, opening up travel, um, very important things. And there were a lot of uh, crises uh, uh, during the Clinton uh, days, uh, those, two, those eight years. Uh, there was a lot of drama. Um, and there was a lot of behind the scenes meetings and talks uh, and emissaries. We tell a story in the book of twice uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez being employed, uh, enlisted by the Cubans and, and used by the Mexicans who were acting as intermediaries as well, um, coming to the United States uh, on seemingly innocuous uh, visits. Um, the first one was a, a dinner uh, at the Martha's Vineyard uh, estate of William and Rose Styron in which Bill Clinton, who was vacationing on Martha's Vineyard that August, was going to be there. And this was supposed to be, uh, we, we kind of call this cocktail diplomacy in our, in our book. But uh, it's a very colorful story of, of Garcia Marquez coming under the pretext of just talking about literature with the President of the United States and a bunch of other wonderful guests at the dinner table and actually carrying a, a message from Fidel Castro uh, about the Balsero crisis uh, and then returning to, to Cuba uh, using a Mexican presidential jet um, with a message from Bill Clinton about uh, uh, the need to end the Balsero crisis. And um, so then there was the um, shoot down of the planes and the back channel diplomacy that went on before that happened. Um, there was a whole internal dynamic in Washington to present a speech on what the administration referred to as calibrated response. Uh, this would be a kind of an idea of, of, of we do this, they do that. Um, perhaps eventually we arrive at, at better relations. But we never actually had talks with the Cubans specifically um, uh, about this, this goal. Fidel Castro asked for those talks. Um, Clinton kind of vaguely promised them and then reneged uh, on that promise. Great. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, more questions, I think, the gentleman there, and then we'll go. Thank you, yes. Uh, Alex Brooks from the UK Embassy here. Uh, Christian, your first question you presented slightly preempted mine, which is about this um, very deliberate and very openly, uh, transparently communicated goal uh, by our administration friends uh, in making certain tweaks to the regulatory um, regime around the embargo to try and stimulate private sector activity in Cuba and indeed private sector commerce with the United States. Um, as I say, they've been very open in saying this is about empowering people, uh, about creating alternative centers of economic power and really of beginning to erode uh, further some of the uh, Cuban state's uh, control over the economy. So, of course, that's, that's a very cleverly thought out strategy on this side, but of course it requires, to a certain extent, some cooperation or some um, acquiescence in Havana from the, from the Castro government. So how do you predict that the, the Castro government will, will respond to this? I think the response will be, will be positive. Um, uh, Josefina Vidal did say shortly after the uh, December announcement that the Cuban government was in favor of all the measures 
the unilateral measures that the United States had announced. Uh, Raul Castro, since 2010, has been promoting the growth of the private sector in Cuba and also turning a number of state enterprises into cooperatives, so expanding the non-state sector of the economy. Uh, the regulations that came out in January uh, speak directly to uh, trade in goods and services with both the private and non-state sector. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, Cuba will be in favor of that. Uh, one of the real problems with the private sector and cooperatives in Cuba is that they are very uh, labor intensive. They are low capital kinds of enterprises and the Cuban state does not have the capital to provide very much financing for them. So to the extent that they can do business with uh, the United States, uh, that brings in